Okay, so Sean asked me to uh, provide a summary of our empirical data uh, from various approaches that we've used in a, in a wide variety of species over the past few years uh, to talk about techniques that were most applicable, why and what's on the horizon, um, and to try and set up discussion points, loose threads. And that's what I keyed in on because I thought, well, I can certainly do that part of it. Uh, and so the, uh, the talk I'm going to give is focused on some of our own empirical data sets, warts and all. So some of this work is published, some of it's unpublished, uh, and we're still struggling with. So I'm going to give an overview of uh, four different projects, all in uh, vertebrates, and talk about uh, uh, several different types of data. Uh, I might talk a little bit about microsatellites, but I don't think so, mostly about SNPs. Uh, but as it turns out, a lot of the, um, the theoretical underpinnings of our analyses for SNPs are based to some degree on microsatellites. And there's a lot of important biological differences in terms of mutational mechanisms, modes of selection, uh, the number of loci surveyed and so forth. So I may touch on that. I'll talk a little bit about some of the genome data that we have and then some of the data that we have on uh, immune loci and how these all relate to conservation genetics. So I'm going to start with uh, golden eagles, really fascinating organism, uh, very difficult to sample. Uh, most of our samples come from naturally shed feathers. And I want to make that point early on that some of the approaches that we're using here in, in conservation genetics rely on uh, small sample sizes uh, for threatened and endangered species, but often small tissue sizes like a naturally shed breast feather from an eagle doesn't yield a lot of DNA for, uh, for some of the molecular approaches that are commonly used with high density SNP arrays like Louis was talking about. Also, we're, I'll talk a little bit about some work in the gray whale where we have uh, very tiny tissue biopsies from a population of whales, less than 200 individuals in total. And those tissue biopsies have to be split between geneticists and ecotoxicologists and uh, for hormone analysis and everything else. So anyway, I think those are, are things to keep in mind. We sequence the genome in the Golden Eagle for a variety of reasons, but in part to develop a small SNP panel, uh, in this case 192 SNPs that could be used to DNA fingerprint naturally shed feathers. And those, fe those feathers could then be assigned to individual birds, the birds to populations that we could do some demographic modeling of turnover in the population, monitoring the same birds over a period of time and so forth. So uh, we developed this panel of 192 SNPs including uh, what we're calling neutral markers. And I'm calling those neutral because what we did, we had the genome sequence, we annotated it, we looked at the intergenic distances. Uh, we found the largest distances, that is uh, the biggest gaps between genes, and we put SNPs there. And we use those as markers. And we also used a suite of non-neutral markers. Uh, and I'm not calling those selected markers, but they are presumably non-neutral. They are in exons of protein coding genes, and in many cases, uh, their variants cause non-synonymous substitution and genes known to be under selection in other species, like Mike did some work on BMP4 gene in falcons, thought to be under selection there. We thought it's a good candidate to be under selection in eagles too, so it's included in the SNP array. And there's pros and cons to using neutral and non-neutral markers for these sorts of purposes. Um, no pun intended, we're trying to kill two birds with one stone. We're trying to get uh, enough SNP markers to assign individual DNA fingerprints to a feather but we're also trying to collect those data and be able to use them in more of an evolutionary context as well. Okay, so this is a, a general overview, a heuristic of what the uh, SNP array would look like in the Golden Eagles, where we got half neutral markers, half non-neutral markers, a couple of mitochondrial haplotype markers there, and also a sex marker so that we can tell if the feather came from a male or a female. We sample Golden Eagles across uh, uh, a portion of North America uh, it's not important and for the sake of time because I want to get to several studies. I'm not going to tell you about any of the real biological outcomes. Uh, most of that work's already been published uh, earlier this year. But here I thought we were being really clever with this neutral and non-neutral thing. But as it turns out, there's not a lot of differences in terms of things like heterozygosity at the gene-associated markers, that is the non-neutral markers and the neutral markers. The distribution of heterozygosity is pretty similar between the two. Which, uh, which may or may not be surprising. Um, I was a little bit more surprised in terms of, of an FST outlier approach, where we compared eagle populations from two different parts of their range here, two different yet 
two more different ones here, two more different ones here. When we arrange all the loci in the same order across all these graphs and the non-neutral markers are shown here in black and the neutral markers are in white, uh, there's not a dramatic pattern that jumps out in terms of more differentiation at the non-neutral markers or vice versa. Um, so I was a little bit surprised um, at this. Uh, nevertheless, when we look at those FST outliers, a number of those uh, non-neutral markers, those gene-associated markers, are associated with things that might actually be under selection. We'll see uh, sperm-associated antigen might be rapidly evolving. Uh, things like this leucine-rich repeat are often associated with toll-like receptor genes, which are a portion of the uh, innate um, immune system, and we've got toll-like receptor genes in here. So we'll see uh, what ultimately comes out of the evolutionary analysis of this conservation genetics data set. Um, Sean asked me to mention in particular this aspect of the data uh, where we see higher overall heterozygosity in adult eagles than we do in chicks. Uh, a pattern of viability selection that to my knowledge was first uh, seen in, um, was it Oates? Bob Allard had a science paper in like 1972. That's the first case I know of. Sean mentioned that it's uh, uh, the same sort of pattern seen in trees and some other organisms. So I think this is pretty interesting. Non-chicks just refers to the chicks here have not fledged yet. So they are still in the nest. Uh, the adults are breeders. So we have uh, genetically tagged their offspring somewhere. The non-chicks are those that uh, probably include both, but we, we can't say definitively they're fledged, but they could be young birds. So this is one interesting pattern that came out of this data set. And again, I'm going to skip the, uh, the biological synthesis here because I want to um, get to the end. One thing I'm not suggesting by showing you a table of genes that might be under selection is that those have uh, any particular importance with regards to management scenarios. If we're trying to, for example, identify populations that might be uh, of some conservation concern. And this is an idea that, uh, that Devin Pierce has got a paper, I think it's out now in Journal of Fish Biology, that's, uh, that's interesting. It's a retake of the classic uh, um, Gould and Lewington paper on the spandrels of San Marcos, saying that, you know, this is a very, whenever we do a, uh, an assay like this and we find these genes that are under selection, this is such a tiny proportion of the genome, we shouldn't be trying to manage for variation uh, at, these, uh, at this small proportion of genes. That's not what I'm suggesting. What I am suggesting, hopefully I'm clear on this, we're using the markers for uh, DNA fingerprinting and demographic modeling, but we're also trying to, to uh, glean some evolutionary insights into them. In terms of uh, outcomes for this workshop that I think uh, might be worth addressing, even if not in this workshop at some point, would be a more holistic uh, analysis that includes genetic and stable isotope data for uh, establishing population affinities. We did a little bit of this in the Golden Eagles, uh, but really they were uh, two separate analyses. We tried to overlay them on top of one another and make some sense of them instead of trying to develop the, uh, the approaches to actually integrate those two. So I wanna switch now to uh, to gray whales and talk about them a little. And I have to tell you a little bit more about the species here. Um, historically, in both the Atlantic and the Pacific, uh, and they've been extinct in the Atlantic since, uh, um, oh, I guess, the latter part of the 19th century, I think. Today, the population of eastern gray whales that occurs along the coast of North America numbers somewhere in the neighborhood of 22,000 whales. And according to IUCN, its conservation status is least concern. So it's fairly healthy. In contrast, the western gray whale population found off the coast of Asia is critically endangered. Uh, I've seen estimates um, 140, 160, 180 individuals, certainly less than 250 individuals off the coast of Asia. So there's a big difference here between these two. And one of the questions is, uh, is there any gene flow between them? Because there is a little bit of data with regards to telemetry. And the telemetry data shows these animals from um, the coast of Asia going all the way around the Gulf of Alaska and coming down the western coast of North America down to Baja, California, which is where the eastern gray whales have nursery grounds. So there's some telemetry data for that. Genetic data, uh, we again sequence the genome. This time uh, we sequence genomes for three individuals, two western gray whales and one eastern gray whale identified a lot of SNPs. 
This time, all of our SNPs came from candidate genes that were identified in other cetaceans for the most part. Um, and note that to date, because there's a lot of permitting and political issues associated with these whales, actually last week we got um, about 30 eastern gray whales in the lab, but so far we only have data from a single eastern gray whale, and that eastern gray whale came from Barrow, the northern part of Alaska, which uh, the, the gray whale aficionados, if you will, will, the real experts tell me it's got to be an eastern gray whale. It's not a western gray whale. They don't ever go up that far. But when I look at a map of, when I look at a globe, I think, okay, I can easily imagine a western gray whale going up there and dying uh, and washing up. It was a beach gray whale. So anyway, I'm a little, I'm agnostic about um, the whole thing. But we took the 35 western gray whale samples, the single eastern gray whale samples, and surveyed them at our SNPs. And it turns out that the, the 36 samples uh, included a number of duplicates. So actually, we ended up with 29 individual whales. And there's not much you can do with, a, with 29 individual whales in terms of trying to figure out if populations are distinct or not. Um, but I thought, well, if the lone eastern gray whale we have is from a distinct gene pool, maybe it's more distantly related to everybody else in the western gray whale population. So is it possible to identify outlier, outlier individuals by their mean pairwise relatedness, go through and calculate all the pairwise relatedness of everybody in the population, population in quotes, and uh, try and identify individuals that might be putative migrants or dispersers. And of course, this approach would also identify highly inbred individuals. Uh, so in some regards, it's a bit similar to assignment tests based on minimizing um, departures from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And this is an approach that in the past was more difficult because microsatellite surveys involved so few loci that the confidence intervals were too large to do anything like this. Uh, but this is what you do, what you see if you calculate mean pairwise relatedness for all of ind individuals in our population. Uh, but the lone eastern gray whale is completely unremarkable down here on the end. So it's no more closely or distantly related to anybody in the western gray whale population than any other western individual out here. So uh, obviously it'll take more individuals to figure out what's going on there, but those are some of the kinds of things we're trying to do with these panels of SNP markers using tiny biopsies. But as I mentioned, we did uh, do some whole genome work here, sequence of genome of three individuals, and I'll skip most of the details about the genome. I will say that overall levels of nucleotide diversity in the genome are not uh, particularly remarkable. We see that the eastern gray whale has a little bit more nucleotide diversity than the western gray whale, but again, that's an N of one here and an N of two here. So I don't put much stock into that, but uh, uh, it's not like they're completely depauperate of any nucleotide variation. That's not the case at all. One of the things that, uh, that I thought maybe we could do with this whole genome data is look at these runs of homozygosity. Um, and this is a heuristic diagram from McQuillan et al. in uh, I think American Journal of Human Genetics a few years ago that just shows that when we've got consanguineous matings like this, so that we've got uh, related individuals in the pedigree, if we follow portions of the chromosome down through time, what we end up with are portions of those chromosomes that are identical by descent. And if we think of, of um, high density SNP arrays or whole genome sequences, those should be reflected by a lack of any diversity in those regions. And those sorts of regions should be more pervasive in small populations where there's a lot of inbreeding. Okay. So uh, under random mating, the length of these new runs of homozygosity regions are, is expected to decrease over time due to uh, recombination and due to de novo mutations. Uh, in contrast, under inbreeding, autozygosity is expected to increase over time uh, increase in the number and length of these runs of homozygosity in the genome each generation. And again, um, I'm going to skip through some of these details. Sean mentioned we might want to talk about these, but if so, maybe we'll come back if there's time later in questions about how we actually did this. Um, and just show you some of the results. Remember, I only had three whole genome sequences, so there's not a whole lot of data here, but what you could see is that the western gray whale genomes are shown in the darker shades, the eastern gray whale in the lighter shades, 
and you can see uh, a couple of things, including that there are more regions, more runs of homozygosity in the western gray whale genomes than in the eastern. Um, and not only are they more in number, but they're more extensive. So the overall links are considerably greater in the western gray whale than the eastern gray whale. And you can see that, you know, in these larger categories tend to be dominated by the western animals. Okay. In this slide, uh, sort of to jump to it here, there are two or three times as many runs of homozygosity in the two western whales shown here at the top. Um, and the overall extent of the runs of homozygosity is two or three times as high in the western gray whales as the eastern gray whales. Now, I'm not going to stand here and make more out of this than what it is, right? The, these are just preliminary data, but I think it's interesting given the, the history of the western gray whale population, the fact that it was um, thought to be extinct for many years before it was rediscovered 20 or 30 years ago with a few animals. So I think that uh, that this inbreeding coefficient as estimated by runs of homozygosity, so shown here is uh, F sub ROH, will become more important because it's pedigree free. This is a case where we don't have to have a, a known pedigree to go through and calculate um, uh, an inbreeding coefficient with each individual. We can do it simply from the genome sequence. So I think in terms of threatened and endangered species, it's got a lot of potential. Uh, but there's still a lot of questions, uh, at least in my mind, surrounding the use of these runs of homozygosity, including lots of the different metrics uh, that, uh, that might come into play, but also things like how does depth of sequencing coverage influence estimates of runs of homozygosity, particularly when working with species um, without any, any sort of genomic infrastructure in place to begin with, right? Where we're doing the, the de novo genome assembly, annotation, everything, putting it all together, trying to make something of it. That's, that's a major issue that's not to be underestimated. So, um, so it remains to be seen what will happen with these runs of um, homozygosity in the future, but I think they've got a lot of potential in conservation genetics. And then to shift gears just a bit to koalas, um, Sean wanted me to talk a bit about, uh, about some of our work on uh, uh, immune genes that are known to be um, subjects balancing selection, uh, right, be involved in mate choice. And in, in uh, this particular example, it's the mate choice uh, that we're interested in. I'm working with one of my former students, uh, Jamie Ivey and, uh, and Bob Lacey at the Brookfield Zoo. And trying to figure out why these koalas won't mate with one another. So oh, Jamie and Bob go through all their mean kinship calculations. They hear the two individuals we should mate. We put them together. Uh, they play Barry White, give them a bottle of wine. Nothing happens, right? Why not? So does it have anything to do with MHC, which is known to have an impact on, on mate choice decisions in a wide variety of vertebrates? Um, and so we sequence the koala transcriptome. Uh, and characterized it and uh, a lot of the immune genes in some detail, and then thought we would do some um, tomaseq sequencing on about a dozen MHC, uh, MHC's major histocompatibility complex, right, part of the adaptive immune system, uh, and then TLR, the toll-like receptors, part of the innate immune system, uh, and try and, uh, and genotype these, and that's turned out to be a bit of a mess. Uh, we went from a dozen amplicons to, to actual genotypes and only about four genes. So uh, that's not worked out quite as well as we'd anticipated, even though we had a great list of candidate genes from the transcriptome work. So uh, then when we tried to amplify a, a suite of those genes in all these individuals, it's just become a bioinformatic uh, uh, mess. I'll leave it there. Uh, it's become a bioinformatic mess, and we don't have any real signal in our data here, so I just thought I'd show a picture of a koala um, <laughs> to say, until we get things sorted out, that's the best I can do right now, because the, the data are just uh, a mess. So, um, so moving right along, the, the last system I want to talk about at all is, uh, is host parasite coevolution, um, and this is a, a, another system that we're working in. Uh, that has an immune component trying to, uh, to sequence, assemble, and annotate uh, the host genome in a passerine bird and then identify and characterize immune genes and their um, associated variation 
in an attempt to better understand the, the coevolution that occurs between the host and the parasite, the, the um, malarial parasites in particular. And it's a um, sort of a long-term collaboration with Bob Rickliffs and then my graduate student, uh, Jenny Antonides. And uh, in this case, we sequence the genome as opposed to transcriptome. Uh, I'll sort of skip to everything other than it's about 29x coverage of the genome. Uh, and it seems to be a fairly unremarkable genome. I won't point out much, but it's a, we've got a pretty good assembly here. Um, we have done a, a guided annotation, if you will, it's a de novo assembly, but the annotation relied on uh, a number of other well annotated bird species, uh, chicken, pigeon, crow, and I identified um, a number of MHC genes and these toll like receptors. Jenny's got uh, a list of nine toll like receptors uh, that are certainly involved in this innate immune response to some degree or another. And we've got um, four MHC genes, class one genes and class two genes, uh, and characterized the nucleotide variation, at least present in the, the couple of individuals that we've sequenced. We haven't looked at runs of homozygosity at all in the banana quit yet, but you could see some of the, uh, the variation that we expect to find in the TLR1A gene uh, at least in our broader surveys. The question now is how to go about doing that given our uh, experience in the koala. So uh, we're moving forward with another pool seek experiment to try and uh, compare infected versus uninfected birds. Um, but there's, the, I mean, there's some strengths and weaknesses to that. Uh, and one of the weaknesses is this pool seek approach only provides frequency data from sequencing reads, not the actual genotype data. And the other problem is we're, we're reducing what I think of as probably more of a continuous variable to a binary variable, infected versus uninfected. Um, it's, it's not ideal, but anyway, you get down to it, these highly polymorphic and highly duplicated immune genes are still difficult to genotype and work with. So I'm not sure why Sean wanted me to say that, but <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of a mess, so. Um, So the last thing I'll, uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I forgot to look at the clock. I think I've got two more slides. Um, Sean mentioned this morning this, uh, this paper that Jana Willoughby, one of my former uh, graduate students, published uh, last year in Biological Conservation, and I did upload that to the, uh, um, to the website, by the way. But it comes back to the microsatellite side of things and hopefully gets back to Mike's charge about uh, indicators, although I confess I'm still struggling a little bit with the idea of converting metrics to indicators. So maybe that's something we can come back to a little bit later. Um, but this was sort of a meta-analysis looking at, uh, I think it was about, I don't know, four or 5,000 papers, uh, lots of microsatellite loci, comparing genetic um, diversity between threatened and non-threatened species. And of course, genetic diversity is reduced in the threatened and endangered species. And the existing criteria used by IUCN, things like the extent of a species range, uh, the number of adults in the population, those sorts of things, don't really effectively identify populations with low genetic diversity. So, uh, so we published this paper suggesting that IUCN identify species of conservation need by estimating the expected loss of genetic diversity. Uh, and this approach actually performs better with, uh, with existing IUCN data than, than what they've done. And so I'll, I won't um, go through this slide in any detail, but this is a figure from the paper that just shows that uh, by taking things like an uh, estimate of census size, using that to approximate effective population size, finding or estimating neutral genetic diversity, and then comparing that to reference zygosity using a, a genetic diversity database, and there are a number of these available now to get an estimate of uh, genetic diversity in your family of interest, for example. And then using an approach to estimate uh, the, the time until a significant amount of the genetic variation is lost, and then maybe this provides a quantitative framework to categorize um, species conservation status for IUCN. So I'll leave it there. And in summary, try and, you know, uh, reiterate the point that genomic data can be used to address conservation issues while also providing ample evolutionary fodder for those of us that, uh, that like to dabble in both conservation and evolution. 
Um, and despite occasional molecular problems like MHC genotyping, most of our struggles in my lab are, are computational and related to meaningful metrics, right? It's not doing the genome sequencing anymore. That's fairly straightforward. And even the assembly and annotation is fairly straightforward now. But to do things like how to call genotypes from, uh, you know, from millions of reads or to quantify runs of homozygosity or copy number variant distributions, which I didn't really talk about, uh, compare transposable element complements, compare the, the distributions across um, different individuals or different populations, I think is something that, that we struggle with. And uh, I think maybe it has some potential. So I'll stop there. Thank all my collaborators uh, and current and former students and postdocs. So thank you. <laughs>